Our speaker, Dr. Kevin Cahale, is the collections manager of the Penn Museum's Egyptian section. He received his BA in Classics and Classical Archaeology in 2003 from San Francisco State University and his PhD in Egyptology in 2014 from Penn. He has been a part of the Penn Museum's South Abydos project since 2008, and his dissertation was the result of three field seasons excavating tombs of royal and non-royal individuals. In addition to his current work on the Palace of Merim Ta, his research interests also include funerary archaeology of the Middle and New Kingdoms. More than all this, though, Kevin is a highly valued colleague who is playing an extremely important curatorial role in the development of our new Ancient Egypt and Nubia galleries. It is Kevin's expertise and research into the Palace of Merim Ta that has shaped the forthcoming upper floor of the new galleries more than anything else. And it is a huge pleasure, after years of sometimes vigorous discussion with him in design meetings, to welcome him here to speak to us on the Palace of Pharaoh Merim Ta, examining an archaeological cold case. Take it away, Kevin. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm going to try and <clears throat> share my screen here. Okay. Hopefully that's working. All right. So thank you, um, Steve, for that great introduction. Um, Ellen and Tina for arranging this whole thing. Um, I'm really happy to be here tonight and hope that this sort of work in progress um, that I've been working on for a number of years now um, will be of, of some interest um, to everyone, um, especially you museum goers from the Penn Museum. So um, what is an ancient Egyptian monument? I think we all might be able to pick a few out, um, like the pyramids, we would say probably a monument. How about temples, those kind of things? These were buildings that were built by the Egyptians for a specific purpose, um, and we would probably term them monuments. But what about palaces? Are palaces monuments? Um, we might think of the White House as a monument now because it has history um, attached to it, but most of these ancient palaces um, were, were torn down once they were used for a, a specific purpose. So it makes us think about what is a monument, um, and I hate to do this to you. Um, I'm a I'm a language nerd, so I'll put one language nerd slide in here, but the rest will be nice pick. Um, but anyway, our term monument um, comes from um, the Latin monumentum, something that we remember, something that is brought to mind. Um, the, the word in Latin means to remember. In Egyptian, it actually comes from a different root. The word that we translate as monument um, comes from a word that means to remain or to endure. But interestingly, the Egyptians had another slightly different take on it, um, as this stela from a man by the name of Montuhotep shows us. Um, it says down here at the bottom, um, the monument of a man is his goodness. He whose character is evil will be forgotten. So in a way, there was, there was a little bit of a statement here that a monument is something that endures, um, but really only good things are the things that endure. Um, the people who do the correct actions are the ones who will be remembered. What does this have to do with the palace? Well, in thinking about this, um, I came up with a number of things. One is that the palace of Marantal was both meant to endure, certainly for the lifetime of Marantal, the pharaoh who ruled about 1213 to 1203 BCE. But it was also meant as a place where Marantal could talk about his good character and the correct action that he took vis-a-vis -vis the gods um, that the ancient Egyptians believed in. To expand upon it a little bit more, though, um, there's another chapter to this story, which is about the excavation of this palace um, in the 19, between 1915 and 1920. This is a story about memory, in, in, in effect, um, where the palace was excavated. We are fortunate to have a lot of notes, but those results of the excavations were never really published. Um, so it was a memory which was created, the archaeologists found it, but then it was lost again. Um, and so in the last few years, we've started a concerted effort of really trying to remember what this thing is, what this monument is, what it was, and what it might be in the future. So where does the story begin? It begins with a couple of different characters here. Um, the man on the right, George Byron Gordon, was the director of the Penn Museum in the early 20th century. 
Um, beginning in the late 1890s or so, um, the Penn Museum funded excavations by the Egypt Exploration Society. Um, and this man here in the middle, William Matthew Flinders Petrie, was one of the excavators. He was all over Egypt, looking at all different sites. He's considered the father of modern Egyptology. Um, and many of the objects in the early parts of the um, collection building of the Penn Museum come from his excavation. Well, so Gordon, Dr. Gordon, sent a letter to Petrie asking, we would like to begin our own excavations at a site of our choosing. Do you know of any individual working in Egypt who would be a good archaeologist? And Petrie sent back a wholehearted recommendation of this man. Clarence Stanley Fisher, who was actually from Philadelphia, graduated from Penn with a degree in, in architecture. He had been in Egypt and the Near East excavating for a number of years, and Petrie had seen him working on different sites and knew that he was a very good archaeologist. So pretty much right away, Gordon offered him a position as the curator of the Egyptian section at the Penn Museum. So here he has his job. He can begin excavating, um, but unfortunately, he doesn't have his own site in Egypt. He doesn't have a place that the Egyptian government will allow him to legally excavate. So what does he do? He stays in Egypt. Um, here he is uh, uh, photographed um, with his wife, Flory, and their son, Clarence Jr. Um, with this man over here, George Andrew Reisner, a very famous Egyptologist. At the time, around 1911 or so, um, Reisner was working for the um, MFA in Boston, excavating the site of Giza, a very famous site, the Great Pyramid um, of Giza is right next to the cemetery that Reisner was excavating in. And knowing that Fisher didn't have his own site to work in, Reisner very graciously allowed him a portion of the cemetery that he was working in. said, you may work in this site and anything that you find um, will be able to be split between you and the, um, the Egyptian government. So Fisher began excavating at Giza, um, the first time he was excavating for the Penn Museum. And here's just a shot of um, some of his excavations in the, in the cemetery. Um, some of these collections, again, at this time period, anything that was found by an archeologist was divided. The Egyptian government saved what they wanted. And the other portion of the finds went to the university or institute that funded the dig. So the Penn Museum is very lucky to have a number of um, really nice objects. This statue here of an individual by the name of Mesty is one of the objects that Fisher found in this cemetery. And one of the great things is Fisher published his excavations. So we have the objects, we also have his publication. It allows modern scholars to look at this site and understand um, what was going on during the Old Kingdom in these tombs that he excavated. So a couple of years passed, um, it was around 1914, about the middle of the year, um, and Fisher went back to Egypt. Of course, again, he still didn't have a site. He didn't have a place to excavate. He was hoping to arrive in Egypt and per persuade the Egyptian government to give him a site. And he had a number of options that he was going to try and pursue. But one of the sort of wrinkles in this whole thing was that the First World War had just begun. Sort of an interesting connection with today being Veterans Day. Um, we have here an image of a newspaper or, paper article where they are announcing that Fisher was going to Egypt. I'm um, in a group of Australians who were um, stationed in Egypt at the time. In fact, some of Fisher's journals mention Australian soldiers coming to the site and saying hello and visiting. So this is the time period that we're looking at. When Fisher arrived in Egypt, as I said, he was trying to persuade upon the Egyptian government, the antiquities organization, allow him to excavate. He had tried um, in a couple of different areas. He tried to get Tanis, the site up in the Delta, um, and at one point he also was trying to get Amarna. Both of these sites were held by Austra Austrian or um, German um, archaeologists, and Fisher believed that because of the war he would be allowed to excavate in these sites. But it turned out the Egyptian government said, no, we're going to save those sites until after the war for their excavators. At around this time, um, Fisher probably had a bit of a luck. The old head of the Egyptian Antiquities Organization, Gaston Maspero, had just retired, had left the position, leaving it to this man, George Darisi. Darisi decided that, well, a good place for you maybe to excavate would be a portion of the city of Memphis. Here's where Memphis is. Memphis is the capital city of ancient Egypt, so it's an extremely important site. Unfortunately, um, 
This site had been excavated previously by Petrie up until about 1909 or 1910. Now, either Darcy didn't know or didn't care, but Petrie said that he really was intending to come back to the site and continue excavations. So this sort of set off a bit of a, of a scandal in archaeology. Um, Petrie was extremely mad that the Penn Museum was given this collection. Um, he swore never to work with the Penn Museum again, saying that we had stolen his site. Um, but what we have is a situation in which Clarence Stanley Fisher was allowed to excavate a small portion of the site of Memphis on behalf of the Penn Museum. Now, what did he find? Um, he wasn't really sure what was going to be there, and his first couple of trenches didn't find much. But very shortly into his first dig season, he found the beginnings of an entire complex of buildings. These buildings all belonged to the Pharaoh Merenta, had been used for a number of different years. And as he continued to excavate for the next five years, he found out that this was a very rare palace structure, a royal palace structure. So here, just for some context, this is the site of Memphis. Um, <clears throat> the ancient, more, most ancient portion of the site is probably here. Um, this is the Nile River as it was in the New Kingdom about the time of Merenta's life. Out here in the desert are some very um, important sites. Saqqara is the location of the Steppe Pyramid. Down here at Dashur, there are pyramid sites belonging to Sneferu of the Old Kingdom, the Bent Pyramid and the Red Pyramid. Um, and further up is the site of Giza. Um, so in the center part of the site here is a large temple dedicated to the main god of Memphis, the god Ta. This is the site where Petrie had been excavating up until 1909. And in fact, this is the Sphinx that the Penn Museum has in its opening gallery. It came from right here. The site down here to the southeast is where they um, get, had gave, uh, they allowed Fisher to excavate. Um, this is the site that we'll be looking at in greater detail today. So by the 23rd of March, 1915, Fisher was um, beginning his excavation at Memphis. At Giza, he had been living in a tent along with all of his workmen. Um, and so this was pretty much the lap of luxury. He moved into a small house right near the site. In his excavation notebook, he says, the house is very satisfactory. We are fortunate to have been able to secure such a place as one can work much better and keep things in better order in a house than in a tent. The large room, which will serve as a general living room, is quite large, with large doors at the north and south ends, opening onto the porches. There are two large divans or couches along the sides, and at the south end, two cupboards for dishes and other things. A round central table for dining. <clears throat> Two small bedrooms open from this with a small water closet connected with it, and the bedroom contains a washstand and a mirror, but nothing else. All ceilings are high, and the house will be nice and cool in summer. By contrast, his workers, who were native Egyptian um, and had been working with him for a number of years already um, at Giza, um, lived right next door in a, a, a tent camp, essentially. He says on the next day, the 12th of March, Friday, during the night, the tents arrived and were brought over to Mitrahina, a little town near Memphis, late in the forenoon. Six of the tents will be erected to the east of the house on a large open place, which is probably the threshing floor of the village. Another tent with the good green one will be erected nearer the house in a clump of trees to the southeast. The green one will be for Rais Mahmoud, our head man. He is also to use my old folding green bed. So the rice is the native Egyptian, the Egyptian person, um, the head man who was in charge of the excavation works. So in March of 1915, excavation work begins. Um, he had about 100 workers, all Egyptians, um, many of whom had, like I say, been working in archaeological sites, either with him or Petrie, for a number of years. Um, and they were extremely skilled. Um, this site was a very challenging one to excavate, and these workmen were extremely skilled. They were essentially separated into four groups, each one with its own leader, and then the rice, or the foreman, was above all four of those groups. So there was a little bit of a hierarchy. Now, Fisher himself um, was a very careful excavator, thankfully for us. 
Here we see him um, in a picture from another site, Dendera, <clears throat> excuse me, down on the ground um, with his, his head in a, in a grave, essentially, right next to one of his um, workers, his foreman probably. Um, so he was a very careful excavator, and actually his notes and things are very good too, but unfortunately he wasn't very good at publishing things. Um, and all of his work, both at Dendera and Memphis, still lacks full publication to this day. Um, so this is where the cold case comes in. He did all of this work. All of these workmen spent, you know, months and months and years of their lives excavating this area, but no final publication was ever produced. We are lucky to have a number of different things. We have Fisher's original excavation journals, where he writes day by day what's going on in the excavations. He draws little pictures and writes notes. We also have hundreds of negatives, photos that were taken on site, and sometimes in his notes he mentions the negatives, so we're able to then correlate the two. We also have um, object registers. In this case, we have little descriptions of the objects, the field number, and in some cases, the actual museum numbers so that we can then go into our collections and look at those objects. We also have things like plans and elevations that Fisher had drawn up with the intention of publishing this, this work. Um, some of these are based upon his early indications and early understandings of the site, um, and some of them are very good. Some of them need a little bit of work. Um, this was not the final um, production version for the publication. Some of these were also used by the museum's um, resident mm -hmm. artist, Mary Louise Baker, who's a very famous individual in her own right, um, to create things like this. This is um, a pretty well-known image of the throne room of the Palace of Marenton, um, based upon the architectural things that Fisher had found, as well as some of the archaeological remains, the patent wall plaster and things like that, as well as the... I know. Yeah, give me one second. Um, the other thing that we have is we have a lot of the objects, the stones themselves. This photo here, you can see the um, Egyptians are crating up column drums and door jams to be sent back to the Penn Museum. Um, we have a lot of this architecture. We also have a lot of the objects. Here's a, a field photograph of a number of stele that he found, Fisher found. Um, and here is a photograph taken quite recently of a statue of the god Osiris, which is from the Coronation Chapel talk about in a minute. Um, so we have collections, we have the objects. In terms of the architecture, um, these are the drawings that Fisher came up with based upon his field work. This is one of the doorways from the palace, a door between rooms 11 and 12. And you can see the state that they were in when he found them. All of these little red lines represent the breaks. The fragments were broken up. Um, you can see here this whole area was missing. When the objects arrived at the Penn Museum, they were then stuck back together again, um, early sort of <laughs> dark age um, uh, conservation work. So here's what the doorway looked like when it was put on display in the 1920s. They actually did a pretty good job filling in the areas of missing stone. So how do we untangle all of this stuff? We've got the objects, we've got the photographs, we've got journals, we've got all of these things. But Fisher never left an overarching understanding from his work. Um, a no publication was produced. So how do we disentangle all of this and understand what we're actually dealing with? Well, the first step um, that I undertook a number of years ago now, I guess in 2015 or so, um, as part of a move project, we needed to move all of the Egyptian collections out of our storeroom in the museum to an offsite location in order to protect them from the construction which was going to happen um, for the new patient pavilion, the new hospital right behind our museum building. And part of this process um, was we needed to do something with all the palace pieces. Um, this is what they used to look like in our old storage room. They were just placed on shelves. Many of them didn't have their own unique numbers, um, and some of them had not been seen in years. The first thing we had to do was lay them all out and give them placeholder numbers. Each stone, individual stone, is now, was now given its own little placeholder number and was photographed with a scale as flat as possible. At that time, I also began trying to put some of these things together. Um, you can see in this image, every tag represents a different fragment of stone. So there's quite a few fragments here. 
Um, and as you'll see in a few minutes, this is a portion of a window um, with the cartouches of Marinta here and a space cut out, space is cut out for light to come through. In addition to these physical reconstructions, um, I also began reconstructing the things digitally. Um, using those photographs which I took, I took the scales and scaled all of the photographs to the same dimensions, and then began through Photoshop, um, essentially sticking all of these things back together again. Now, in some cases, I was able to use um, information from the notes and records, and in other cases, I had to actually rely on ink inscriptions on the actual stones. At the time of excavation, the excavator would write on the back what room the object had come from. So in some cases, I was only able to put these together through that method. So after I had done some of that, um, the next question was, well, what was the building really like? We have some of these elevations and the beautiful Mary Louise Baker picture, um, but that's only one room of the building. What did the rest of it really look like? So then I delved into the notebooks. Um, I read through all of the notebooks and correlated what I was reading with the photographs as well as the plans. And an interesting thing is these plans are very useful and they're very good. However, if you didn't know that the three different colors here represent three different archeological layers, you'd have a hard time understanding what this plan shows. And that's where the notebooks come in. It's now clear that the blue areas overlay the orange area and the green areas overlay everything. So they're all stuck together on the same plan, but it actually represents hundreds of years of archeological um, layering and strata. So the next thing that I did was taking these notes and plans and dimensions and drawings and things, um, I moved into SketchUp. Um, I wanted to see the building and feel what it was like to walk through it. And so I began to reconstruct it and look at contemporary buildings of the time <clears throat> to try and figure out what did the front of the building look like? Um, we knew what the, um, the columns and the doorways were like, the stone elements, um, but what were the mud brick elements like? So I began to sort of reconstruct these things in order to understand what this palace complex was like. But for the rest of the time, I'd like to sort of take a, um, a walk through this building, um, a tour through the palace complex, as it were, beginning with the first thing that Fisher excavated this building down here. <clears throat> now, in April of 1915, um, Fisher was, well, by the end of April, the 30th of April, um, Fisher's workmen were down about this level. You can see there were still standing columns and door jams, two columns and two door jams. This building, um, he didn't fully understand what it was. He knew that it belonged to Marinta because the cartouche of that pharaoh was on the, uh, the objects but he didn't really know what it was for. He struck on the idea that maybe it was a gateway, an entrance gateway. So he began calling it the South Portal because it was on the south side of the site. However, in looking at this, this whole area again, it's pretty clear to me um, because his, his excavations went further back here and found the rest of the building, um, that this was actually a fully formed building and had something to do with the coronation of the king making the king into the king. Um, so I've, I've started to term this building the Coronation Chapel. It's almost a slightly religious building. It's, it's really connected with the idea of the gods and the king. And in this way, it is kind of a monument. Um, in a way, it, it commemorates and talks about the character and the duties of the king. Um, and it transforms this man, Merenta, from a mortal man into a semi-divine pharaoh of Egypt. So this is one of the ways um, that I think that the building probably looked. Again, this is a work in progress, um, but it was opened at the front with the two columns on this portico. The door jams behind it led into what was probably a religious shrine type of place or something along those lines. Um, but there was also other parts to the building, other doorways um, and other rooms. For instance, behind this wall was a small room full of stele that were left by non-royal individuals wishing to link themselves with the greatness of the, the pharaoh. But perhaps the, the door jams um, are some of the best ways to understand what this building was and why, it, um, why we can consider it a monument. 
These are drawings, which are actually unfinished, but they are drawings that are held by the Penn Museum's archives um, that were done by Fisher after the excavations. These are the two door jams, the right jam and the inside, and the left jam and its inside. So if we look at these and begin at the top, what we see are there are four major panels. These are all images of the king with the gods. And then at the bottom is an image of the king by himself. What this is, is in effect a playbook or a cheat sheet of what kingship was in the ancient Egyptian mentality. At the top, the first of these, we have the god Re Atum, who was the creator god, one of the main creator gods of the Egyptian pantheon. And he hands over the crook and the flail. These are the scepters of power to this man here, who is Marinta. These are his cartouches. And the text in the middle makes it fairly clear. It is to you that I have given years as king, that you might celebrate every hebsed, which is a religious festival or a jubilee, like that which I have done. It is to you that I have given the crook and the flail, that you might rule the two lands with your strength. So it's the creator god, the supreme being of the Egyptian pantheon, who gives Merenta the right to rule. If we move down one group or one um, uh, image, we have this individual. This is the god Ta, who is, remember, the patron god of Memphis. He's also the god of craftsmen. And as the god of craftsmen, somebody who makes things, he is intimately connected with the act of creation. Here, he holds a stylus and he counts notches on a palm frond. He says, it is consisting of millions of years that I have written your annals. I've essentially made your reign very long. May you celebrate every jubilee like that which I have done. <clears throat> If we move down again, we see another divinity, another god, this, this time the god Nefertum, who is the god of the lotus. Here, the god is handing over three hieroglyphs, three implements, a wa scepter representing dominion, an ankh representing life, and a jed pillar representing strength. He says in the text here, may you remain youthful in life and dominion. May your majesty breathe the lotus, Nefertum, the joy of Ta. So now the king is being given the ability to rule, the strength, the life, the stability, these kind of things. At this point, we now leave the divine realm and come down into sort of the ter terrestrial realm. The king now is the largest individual in the scene. He's the most important. Here he is in the traditional smiting scene. In one hand, he holds the mace, weapon, in the other hand, he holds the hair of these poor individuals. These are the foreign enemies of Egypt. This whole image, the smiting scene, was meant to portray the idea that the king controlled chaotic elements and kept Egypt safe. He was the one who kept Egypt together. This image down here is called the Sematawi, the uniting of the two lands. The idea is that the king kept the country together. It was him that bound everything together. So at this point, we have the king receiving the right to rule from the gods, the ability to rule, and long reign. And now we have what the king is supposed to do. He's supposed to be an upright individual who protects Egypt. In passing, one interesting thing about this is these are the cartouches of Merenta at the top, the lord of the two lands, lord of appearances, Merenta, given life like Rey. So we know for a fact that this was created by Pharaoh Merenta. However, at the bottom down here, we have another cartouche. And interestingly, reading this cartouche, it's not the cartouche of Merenta. It is, in fact, the cartouche of a king, Ramses IV, who ruled some 50 or so years after Merenta, stuck down at the bottom as a sort of afterthought. What this indicates is that this building was definitely used or reused by Ramses IV some 50 years later. And without going too far into it, and we know that the building was reused and remodeled actually a number of times, probably lasting for about 100, 150 years or so before it was eventually um, demolished. The columns in this, in this building reinforce this idea um, very succinctly. On one side of the columns, we have an image of the god Ta, whose hand is up, handing over these same hieroglyphs of dominion, life, and stability 
to the pharaoh Merenptah. But this is a give and take relationship. The gods will give him the right to rule, but he has to do something for the gods. And here on the other side of the column, Merenptah is giving a little seated image of the goddess Maat, the goddess of truth, justice, correctness, to the god Ta. So like I was saying earlier with monuments, um, the monument of a man is his greatness or his, um, his correct living, if you will. Um, in this case, Merenta is saying that very overtly, that he has been given the right to rule, but it's because he is a correct ruler and does the things that a ruler should do, that he has been given that right. So that's this building, the Coronation Chapel, um, definitely connected with the king becoming the king. But once he's become the king, what then? Well, that's where the palace comes in. This was almost certainly a ceremonial palace, um, which should be stressed. It was a palace that the king probably didn't live in permanently, but may have spent a number of days here and there, either during his coronation or perhaps during certain festival days taking place at the Temple of Ta. So like the coronation chapel, um, I've been working on and work in progress, um, but I've been working on a three-dimensional reconstruction of the palace building. The palace consists of a number of parts. There is a wide open courtyard in the middle. This is um, sort of the heart or the middle of the building. To the north is a series or suite of rooms, but the main section that we're going to look at today is at the south end of the building, where the main throne room and some of the royal apartments were. As far as we can tell, the main entrance into the building was actually from the west through one of these doors, bringing you directly into the center part of the building, this open courtyard. If we then head to the south a little bit, we pass through a monumental doorway for scale. Here is um, the king, Marantah, to greet us as we enter into his house. And we enter through a hypostyle hall to this, the doorway leading into the throne room. Um, these doorways were all made out of limestone, were carved with the names and titles of the king. And here we see an excavation photograph from 1916. These are the throne room doors. Again, a lot of this stuff was damaged when Fisher excavated it. Um, he found the lower portions of the doorways still in situ or in place, um, but the upper portions were sort of scattered around. Because he was a careful excavator, he saved all of the different pieces of stone and on site was able to reconstruct what these doorways would have looked like. But here you can see at the bottom portion of these doorways, there are these standing figures. These are the gods Hopi, the Nile god, god representing the Nile fertility really, um, walking and bringing offerings into the throne room for the king. Now, an interesting thing about this, when Fisher found this, you see these little pits here behind the door jams. Within these pits, Fisher found bronze fragments. And taking these out and studying them and cleaning them, um, he was able to come to the conclusion that these were the hinges or the door posts that actually allowed the wooden doors of the throne room to open and close. Um, our conservation de department at the Penn Museum has been doing some work on this. And here you see an X-ray showing three of these fragments with the text, the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Merenta, son of Re, and here's a reconstruction, what this fragment would have looked like originally. For context, imagine this is the door. There would have been these posts on the top and the bottom, allowing the door essentially to hinge and to open. Now, if we move from here, um, we'll go around the side. There is a secondary entrance into the palace from this portion of the, um, of the building. Off to the right, you'll see the doorway over here. This is where the king perhaps could enter into the throne room. And as we take a left, we'll enter into the main throne room of the palace. Now, this is really the heart of the building. This is the, the, the room that Mary Louise Baker um, reconstructed in her, her lovely drawing. As far as we can tell, um, this area of the palace consisted of a rectangular room with six columns, massive columns, holding up a wooden roof. There were doorways leading off in most directions, some to storerooms and other areas. But as we'll see in a few minutes, these doorways here led off into the back part of the palace, the sort of more intimate apartments of the king. 
Now, this chamber would have been sort of dark, um, but it was lit by a, a number of different limestone windows, probably in two different tiers, um, some in the walls here and others up at the top. Now, I mentioned these windows earlier. Um, this is a very quick sketch of one of those windows. Remember those fragments that I put together and placed on that table? Um, this is what that window would have looked like. You can see the cartouches of Marenta here, separated by these little cutouts. And the bottom portion would have been this grill work, like this, this grill work here. Um, this image on the left is from a still standing building in Egypt. This is the Temple of Karnak. And this is how the windows would originally have looked in the palace throne room of Marenta. We are lucky to actually have two pretty good examples of smaller windows from the palace at the Pentium. Here, this one is a little bit more detailed. Um, it has images of the king as a sphinx with his little uraeus and his nemes and his false beard, um, his lion body. At the bottom, there are the hieroglyphs Jed for stability, um, and here, the slat work. Now, these windows were designed to allow light in, but they were also designed to let the heat of the summer out, to try and keep the room cool. Now, if we go back into the throne room, one of the other major things that Fisher found was this throne dais, or throne platform. Here you can see what it originally probably looked like. It was a rectangle decorated with a number of different images upon which the throne sat. Now, of course, this throne is not the ancient throne. This is just a model and sketch up of one of the chairs of King Tut, um, but you get an idea of sort of where the king would have sat. Unfortunately, Fisher didn't find the original throne. But this is what this part of the building looked like when Fisher excavated it. You can see this is the throne dais here with the ramp leading up and two stairways leading down from which the king would be able to enter and exit from the back portion of the, the palace. Here are the six column bases um, and the walls of the chamber. Now, there are a few other examples of throne daises like this um, in Egypt. Here is one from the small palace of um, Ramses III at Medinet Habu, similar kind of thing with an entryway or a ramp, in, case, in this case, it's a stairway, and two smaller stairways off the sides. The Maranta example is highly decorated, and all of these colors are what Fisher originally found during his excavation. Now, the decoration is sort of interesting links back to what we were talking about earlier in the Coronation Chapel. What you can see are images of bound captives. These are the foreign captives, um, the enemies of Egypt. For comparison, this on the left is one of the sandals belonging to King Tut. Again, we see the same bound captives, in this case, a Syrian and a Nubian. The idea here is that the Egyptians believed that frauding on your enemies magically would subdue chaos and keep Egypt safe. Every time the king walked up onto the throne dais, he was sort of magically trampling the enemies of Egypt. Now, in the back part of the palace, if we pass by the throne dais, we enter into a smaller suite of rooms, um, which kind of replicates the throne room um, uh, that we just looked at in a smaller setting. But it also includes a couple of other very interesting parts of the building um, that give us a little bit of a window into um, sort of the the human life of the pharaoh, Merenta. This is the portion of the building that we're looking at. We just came from the throne room here. We went through this doorway, and we're now standing in this hallway. Um, around the side are a number of four rooms and other rooms for keeping things. We're not entirely sure what these rooms were used for. At the back part of the building is another room with two columns, which was almost certainly a secondary or a more sort of family audience hall, or one for smaller groups of people. And around this, this smaller throne room were a number of very important rooms. One of them that we'll look at next is this one, room 10, which is probably the king's bedchamber. Room one over here, um, interestingly, is probably his bathroom. Um, and this is probably where the, the real royal throne was, his toilet. Um, and then the other side, this is the um, bathing chamber, so this is where he would have taken his daily bath. The other chamber here also had a raised platform. It was probably sort of a day bed or a resting chamber, something along those lines. 
If we move first down the hall this way, um, to the west, doors. and this was almost certainly the king's bedchamber. There was a raised platform at the south end of this chamber and a little ramp leading up to it. And this platform would have probably held the king's bed, which I've stuck in here with a, with a model from SketchUp. Now, again, we have comparanda for this, other palaces, even though palaces are extremely rare in Egyptian archaeology, um, the couple that we do have um, do actually show us that this is um, a common feature. This is, again, the palace of Ramses III at his mortuary temple at Medinet Habu. And here, just off of that throne room that you saw a moment ago with the throne dais, um, is this raised platform and a stairway leading up to it, where the king's bedchamber, or at least a couch, or some place for him to rest, has been positioned. Now, if we come back again to that hallway, we're now going to enter into the main, or the secondary, I guess you could say, the smaller throne room. And we'll take a look around. There are two columns in the center part of this, holding up, again, a roof with almost certainly clerestory windows at the top. A small throne dais at the back would have held another royal throne, allowing the king to hold smaller audiences. Um, but what I want to look at is actually this room over here. Um, oh, I first, first of all. Um, the walls of these, of these chambers um, were made out of plastered mud brick. They didn't fare too well over the millennia. The stone doorways were very well preserved, um, all things. But the walls themselves, being only mud brick and plastered, didn't, didn't survive too well. But fortunately, because Fisher was a, a very careful excavator, was able to, he was able to figure out what the walls looked like. There was actually painted decoration on these walls. So here's a reconstruction based upon the notes that Fisher took. And what we see is that in these colors, these original colors, the king's cartouches, he had two, his throne name and his birth name, were placed in between these little Ankh signs holding wasp scepters. Ankh means life, this is a hieroglyph, and wasp, another hieroglyph, means dominion. The little basket at the bottom is another hieroglyph meaning all. So this is all life, all dominion. Um, so this is what the bottom portion of the wall was decorated with, these little niches down near the floor. Then if we come back to this, imagine these walls were brightly painted. Um, but this chamber I sort of wanted to, to end on tonight um, because of the, the text around the doorway is sort of interesting or funny. Um, this doorway is currently in the Cairo Museum. Some of the stuff came to the Penn Museum, some of it stayed in Egypt. So if you're in Cairo, you can see some of this palace as well. But the text around this door frame, um, not only does it have the king's cartouches and names in the top, but this text here reads, O king of upper and lower Egypt, lord of the two lands, Bob Ray, Mary Amun, son of Ray, lord of appearances, Merenta, Hetep Permat. Quite a name, isn't it? Purify your soul in these waters of life and dominion. This door gives us a hint as to what happened in this room. Purify yourself in these waters. So if we take a little journey into this room, it turns out that this room, unlike the others that were mud brick walls, this one was completely lined in stone. And the stone had a very similar um, pattern to the walls. This was his bathing chamber. Um, and this is what it looked like when Fisher excavated it, all lined in stone. Very quickly to sum up, um, what is the future of this building? Well, our conservation department has been working tirelessly to try and um, put back together some of these doorways and to conserve and preserve these objects for future generations. But what about display? When the Penn Museum's Egyptian wing was built, originally the intention was to place these columns and doorways from the Coronation Chapel upstairs. But unfortunately, um, at the time that they came to put the actual pieces in, they realized that the floor probably couldn't support the weight too well. So they were placed downstairs. And many of you have probably seen, um, this is what the lower galleries used to look like with, these are the Coronation Chapel columns and doorways. Here is one of the columns from the palace and one of the door frames. You'll also know that recently we moved the Sphinx up to the main entrance hall. Um, here I am just holding up the back end of the project, as it were, um, as is usual. Um, so the, the, the past year or two, or a few years, actually, since um, more than a couple of years, 
We've tried to come up with a design for our galleries and what they're going to look like with the intention of trying to recontextualize the objects. The engineers have done magic, essentially. They're going to reinforce the floors and give the structure enough, hold up these columns in the upper gallery. So now we're going to be able to display these things. Remember, this is the front of what the Coronation Chapel probably looked like. This is our vision for what we're going to have in the upper gallery, Coronation Chapel columns and gateways behind it. The areas around the walls we will then use to talk about what was this building? How was it excavated? Turning around then, here is the throne room. We're going to try and replicate that throne room experience, the columns and the doorways even a little model throne dais and our statue of Ramses II sitting where Marenthal would have sat. So that visitors to the Penn Museum in coming years will be able to, in effect, step into the palace of Marenthal. So thank you to everybody um, who gave all of their support for this project, um, everybody at the Penn Museum, um, the Egyptian section, everybody that works there, the conservation department doing their great work, um, Haley Sharp, their design, all of the design team. And yeah, um, hopefully it's enough time for a couple of questions.